Cypress Development Corp is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Welcome back to the show, Danielle. Thank you, Jim. Daniel, what happens when millions of people and businesses stop paying their debts? Yeah, so cash flow comes to a screaming halt, and that's a problem for a highly levered economy. Um, in the private sector, we have, especially in places like Canada, we have the highest corporate and household debt that we've had in many, many decades. And, um, you know, cash flow is the lifeblood of maintaining payments. And whenever you have an abrupt stop in cash flow like we did with the COVID lockdown, um, it, it quickly reveals the insufficient stores and um, capital that people are lacking. And, you know, some people have expressed shock that it took just a couple of weeks of missed income for people to not be able to pay their rents or their mortgages, but I wasn't surprised because, of course, I've been tracking that data for a long time, and, um, you know, we know from all kinds of studies that um, the savings rate has been minuscule to nil for the last few years in Canada and that many households reported they didn't have enough cash in their normal budgets to even pay a couple hundred dollars of unexpected costs. So, um the and and the, yes, we've had these deferral programs, as you know, um, where you know banks have given millions of uh, of approvals to skip mortgage payments, you know, um, and uh, also some car loans, leases, you know, regular because people have a lot of different kinds of payments, credit cards, other personal lines of credit, all that sort of thing. So there has been deferrals offered. The problem is that this is a a bandage at best because. The, the income that's lacking, that's been missed, even with the big support programs from the Canadian government, for example, it's estimated that households are missing at least 20% of the normal, normal income. So a 20% hit to your income when you were barely covering the basis before is a big problem. And so we've got this, you know, deferral cliff, cliff looming as, as what the head of the CMH HC noted um, in the last week he was talking, gave a speech last week, and he said, we've got this deferral cliff coming in Feb- in September, excuse me, where, you know, mortgages that were loan payments that were delayed or allowed to be deferred uh, for up to six months will all come due in September. And at that point, even if people have been called back to work, you know, the problem is they were, they're still missing the chunks of income even with the government payments they may have received. And so it isn't going to be as simple as, well, I'm back to work now, so now I can pay my current rents and payments and car loans, et cetera, and also catch up the stuff I fell behind on. And so really, you know, what we have is a, a, a growing insolvency problem and the delays or the deferrals that have been offered uh, are acting as if it's just a liquidity issue, you know, like that there'll be enough income in September to pay all these back payments, but there won't be. And the other thing that we have to deal with here is that, you know, now in the United States, for example, as of this morning's data, there's been more than 40 million jobs lost, Jim, in just the last three months. Um, it took a decade to grow back the 22 million jobs um, that were, you know, achieved over the 2009 to 19 expansion to take unemployment from a very high level to a very low cyclical level, which it did into 2019. It took a decade to do that. Now we're talking about um, having lost jobs nearly twice that amount. 40 million in Canada, well over 3 million jobs missing. And, of course, we also know that the reopening hopes, there's a great optimism around, you know, now we're starting to let businesses reopen. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it's not likely to be, uh, it's, it's likely to take many years here 
for jobs to recover, for incomes to be made whole. And in the meantime, you've got this ongoing solvency problem. You couple that with the fact that, you know, the main go-to over the past number of years of how Canadians have made ends meet has been not just, uh, you know, personal lines of credit and credit card use and financing everything under the sun, but the rising home prices, right, which has allowed them to keep consolidating debts, increase the mortgage, get a second mortgage in some cases, sometimes a third, um, you know, take the money that they owe on credit cards, put it all into a different um a, a, a loan against their property, and then away they go again. Well, that's essentially been gutting any equity that they have gained in this run-up. And, of course, we know that even in 2017, for example, the Bank of International Settlements was saying how Canada had the most overvalued real estate in the world relative to incomes and rents and um, things like that were real-world you know, household connection to what people could afford. So that was in 2017. And then we find out that, you know, um, the frenzy that happened in the two years after that, the matters got even worse because, you know, there was a recent CIBC uh, urban nation study done just talking about um, how 48% of all new completed condos um, in the large centers in Toronto and Vancouver areas since 2017 were bought purportedly for the purpose of renting out. So these are essentially speculating at all-time highs in price relative to rents. Um, half of them in 2019, before COVID hit, were negative carry, not making enough rent, even if they were rented out, to cover the um, the holding costs. So they were funding this all out of income from other sources or refinancing other properties. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of them already had high interest rates. The central bank rates have been kept low, as you know, but the real rates that people are paying um, have been rising, actually, in the last year. So if you're looking at um, personal debt payments as well as, you know, um, mortgage rates for uh, 30% of the, those studied in this, uh, uh, with regard to the investing in condos aspect, were paying uh, 6% or more as an interest rate, and this is in this supposedly low-rate environment. And since the COVID uh, stress has hit, it's become harder to get credit and more expensive. So this is partly why we've seen central banks step in trying to fund f- funnel more money into the corporate uh, debt market is because there was this big crunch on capital, crunch on income, um, re- uh, borrowing rates or interest rates, you know, spiked much higher. And that's all just compounding the problem. So really, as I've said many times, we set up really poorly for any kind of shock or or adversity of any kind. And of course, life's not like that. You're always going to get shock and adversity. And boy, did COVID-19 ever give us that with both barrels. So now we're discovering in real time, Jim, to answer your question, what happens when millions of people stop paying their their debts. But the the very... um, probable or uh, likely outcome is that you're going to see a lot of defaults because essentially these bills that couldn't probably be repaid before are um, not going to be repaid now. So we're looking at probably a lot more filing of insolvency, which the trustees in bankruptcy have already had a banner a few years in the last couple of years in Canada, but we're going to see, you know, a resurgence and especially um, I think when people realize that these um, CERB program, the 2000 a month that they've been able to apply for in this period, is taxable income. So when they go to file their taxes at the end of the year, you know, not only will they earn less in 2020 from whatever income they've had job-wise, but also there was no source deductions taken off of the money they were getting from the government in the shutdown period. And so there's going to be a tax bill due. And that'll be due by, you know, April of next year. So again, it's, it's gonna, you know, what's going to happen is there's gonna be a lot more defaults, there's gonna be a lot more people in financial stress, and I think a lot more bad debts written off by Canadian banks and lenders, which is essentially what we're seeing this week with the Canadian bank reporting. They're all, you know, from 100 to 500 percent increases in their uh, provisions for bad loans. Uh, which are, you know, the deferrals are not considered bad loans yet because they're legally deferred. But once you get into a period where people are supposed to be paying back, 
then the banks have to start moving, you know, more of the deferrals onto the bad loan section of their of their statements. And that impacts earnings, which is what we're seeing, you know, 79 to 50% declines in reported earnings. And that was just to the end of April, right? So that half of that quarter wasn't even really the COVID shutdown. The second quarter, we're going to see a, a lot more of that. So this all ties into the Canadian credit cycle, and it's been going on so long um, that people became very complacent with it, but it wasn't sustainable, and indeed now we're seeing the dominoes start to fall. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Danielle Park. Danielle, are we seeing rents falling for both tenants and uh, commercial clients, and is that a good thing? So one of the benefits that will probably come out of this um, this whole disruption and strain that's moving the dominoes, as I described them, that are falling, is that we're moving towards cheaper rents, cheaper home prices, um, cheaper uh, commercial retail space rental. So those will ultimately be positive, but only for those looking to rent or, you know, buy shelter or space. The people that own it presently are going to have, going to be the givers in this equation, right? So um, already in, just in April, in the greater Toronto area where I live, there has been this 91% increase in new listings of furnished condos, for example. So this is, um, you know, the Airbnb had written a letter um, when the COVID shutdown, for example, the short-term rental company Airbnb um, had written a, a, ple- a plea to the federal government saying, you must help us because, um, you know, you should look at bailing out Airbnb people because uh, a third of the, the people are not going to be able to stay in their properties, whether they're renters who are, you know, subleasing out through short-term rental or whether they're owners who have bought these properties on the presumption they would always have this steady stream of people coming to rent. And so what's happened is all those, you know, and this is every city in the world, frankly, if you've traveled in the past few years, uh, certainly tons of it in Vancouver and British Columbia and, you know, all over the world, where a lot of people were buying properties and making them into these, you know, fully furnished, equipped apartments, but only for international travelers, you know, foreign students on limited time periods. And the idea was, well, you know, why would I rent to a regular tenant uh, for a long term when I can get more bang for the buck, I can get a higher rate of rent by doing the short-term rental? And so people were literally buying up uh, properties on the presumption that this would be a never-ending flow of, of business. And of course, again, with the COVID shutdown, international travel evaporated, foreign students all went home, um, and you have had now, as I described, so many of these properties were negative carrier, barely breaking even to cover their costs before the shutdown. And now, as you know, it's becoming clear that even if we're starting to reopen restaurants and barbershops and things, we're not going to have a, a big resurgence in, you know, those foreign students coming back. For example, schools are now saying they're going to be available online in the fall. So a lot of student traffic, um, international and domestic, that would normally flock back to large cities where these schools are looking for places to live are now not going to be doing that. And so there's this sort of a revelation hitting that, wow, um, we can't um, continue to fund these places in the way that we have been doing. 
and they are putting these properties on the market. So already um, in the first part of May, the median monthly rent for a condo in the GTA was down about 4.3% from a year ago. Um, and there was uh, a, more than a 40% drop in the number of signed leases. So now, of course, you can extrapolate these trends and see that, you know, Capital Economics is predicting that you'd see a 5 to 10% decline probably in rents, the, average, the median rent in Toronto and Vancouver area over the next year. Um, and then there's thousands more properties that are just under construction, particularly in Toronto. Uh, something like 80,000 units are still coming online in the next two years. So this is going to sort of compound this massive oversupply. And, you know, we, we again, this is not a surprise because for the last couple of years, Toronto, for example, has had the most um, large construction cranes of any city in North America. You know, um, the largest percentage of construction cranes, and they're doing these mixed-use residential commercial properties, towers. Um, you know, uh, second was L.A., and third was um, Calgary. So, uh, you know, Calgary has more commercial space per capita than any other city in North America, and this was before the latest uh, oil crash and, you know, COVID shutdown. So we've just been, you know, again, this is part of this easy money, long extended credit cycle where people thought it was a no-brainer to just borrow money and buy, you know, more of the what, what it worked. And so you get this misallocation of capital out of productive investment and into trend-following speculation, which is what we've had with, with a vengeance. And so, of course, it made prices go up and rents go up, and so it became very difficult for people to live in urban centers. Workers, even people that were fully employed with good jobs, were having a really hard time. Uh, you know, it's up to 50% of their income was going to just keep the shelter over their house, uh, over their heads. So the good news is that now we've got a number of trends that are working in favor of pricking that bubble. Again, good news for the real economy, for people looking for places to live, uh, bad news for asset owners, right, uh, for uh, cr- companies, private equity, all these people that have been collecting rents, well, they're not getting the, the rents and income flowing through um, because of the deferrals, also because of the bankruptcies, which are now st- starting, right, with uh, that was already underway in the commercial space, of course, for some time, you know, the retail ap- apocalypse and all the people spending less at bricks and mortar, all that was already in motion. Now we've really accelerated that trend and even more so. So you've got, um, you know, the the up to 80, 80%, for example, of the employees at Bank of Montreal have been told that they can work from home permanently going forward. You know, Shopify out of Ottawa has said most of its employees will now start working from home going forward. This is even after, you know, presuming there's a, a vaccine at some point for, for, you know, the coronavirus or this particular coronavirus, even assuming all that, people are saying, hey, if I don't have to travel into the city center every day for work, then I also don't need to live right near the city center. So I could take that funds that I would have spent for a 600-square-foot box in the sky downtown, and I could go out somewhere and buy something you know, with a little bit of uh, green around it and get a lot more dollar for my shelter, or even rent, if I'm renting, I can get a lot more uh, shelter uh, for my dollar outside. So all that exodus from the city and, and the concern about, you know, future um, pandemic events, which are highly probable to come, I think now that we've all lived through one, our, our perception of how much space we'd like to have around each other and how close we want and how much we want to be all on top of each other, I think that may be changed for our entire generation at this point. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, 
radio and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Danielle Park. Danielle, speaking of uh, home space, how many Canadians are even thinking about buying a home right now? Yeah, so they, you know, they do polls of that kind of thing um, and on a regular basis. And um, one of the companies that uh, does that publishes it online. Um, Point Two Homes is a is a company who does that. And their recent survey, they found that Canadians who tend to buy, who said they intended to buy in the next six months, had fallen significantly um, to 24%. Um, from 31% in their last survey, um, and that uh, a, new, a lot of them were noting that they were actually 37% were saying, of those that were saying they were looking, were saying they were looking for less expensive homes. So this goes back to my point um, that the motivation here, and again, I've talked about this as a theme that's been around for the past few years, of boomers who are undersaved and over-invested uh, in um, expensive property, you know, as the Bank of International Settlements pointed out, the most expensive value, overvalued property in the world in Canada. So you've got boomers coming into their 60s, uh, you know, realizing they're cash light and asset rich, thinking, wow, if I could, you know, sell this house to someone and take out a bunch of money, I could use that for retirement and then I would have less upkeep and maintenance and costs and taxes and everything that I have with all the big expensive property, you know, the downsize idea, right? So that was underway already for a considerable, uh, for the last few years and we knew that that was likely to intensify as more and more people enter into their 60s and that's been happening, of course. So over the next 20 years, that the, the amount of people over 65 actually doubles so it is um, here to stay. It's what we would call a secular trend of people looking to downsize and take funds out of housing. Um, but uh, in addition, I just think that this whole financial crunch has, again, accelerated even those who were younger, who were just barely making uh, you know, their payments before, are now thinking, wow, this is crazy. How do I, how do I get some peace? How do I downsize this? intense financial pressure and have a little more, uh, you know, flexibility, time for exercise, time for cooking my own food, time to be with my family more, a little more life-work balance. How do I do that? Well, lowering your living costs is a huge chunk of that puzzle, right? And so that is um, something that uh, a lot of people, they're aware of, Either even the ones that are still working, um, they're thinking, you know what, I feel very vulnerable, I feel very afraid, I would like to have a greater cushion, I would like to have more of my income stick to me as it comes in rather than just flow all out on payments and costs all the time. So that means, you know, lowering commute times, for example, and the uh, People are, are amazed how much less they're spending um, being able to work from home, and that's another motivation, um, is they're spending so much less on clothing and transportation costs, uh, whether it's fuel or public transportation, um, and they're just, and eating out. They're just not eating out to the same extent. They're not doing that Starbucks bucks walk by, you know, twice a day and that sort of thing. So all those holes in the bucket have sort of been stopped up, and people are thinking, hey, I can actually save money and have less stress in in this kind of an approach so the whole motivation you know is 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 about um spend less and save more and that's been the theme that i've been speaking about for some time and it's now really accelerating across a whole bunch of age groups and of course if you can work from home you have a choice maybe you'd like to work from your cottage instead of uh your like you said your cramped little condo downtown well, I think it really, um, I think, you know, in, in, in an environment where everyone's preoccupied with going out, being out, being seen, being in bars and restaurants and being in the heart of the city, so to speak, that's, there's a certain sense of, well, all you need is a place to sleep. But when you're in an environment of clampdown or lockdown where you're literally, you know, in your living space, um, whether it's to work or most of the time because everything's shut down, it really reorientates your view of what a home is or what a home can be or what you want in a home. And I think these are a permanent type of adjustment. Even as things start to reopen, as I say, I don't think people are going to forget this whole anxiety around, you know, a lot of crowds and being 
you know, very much on top of each other. So I think it's really shifting behavior. And uh, also, I'm wondering if more people stay in the burbs to work, uh, will the municipalities allow things like food trucks to wander through a neighborhood like the ice cream trucks do, so that if you want to treat yourself uh, to a special latte or something, you can run out and get it? Because oh, right I'm now- sure that business models will evolve. I'm sure that there are many smart people in the food and beverage industry who will look for new business models as their current one, uh, you know, is under strife. And there's definitely um, all kinds of innovation coming for to serve this new mentality, this new um, this new preoccupation. You know, um, other benefits that come from it are, you know, uh, we're getting cheaper education spending because people that are studying online are typically more consolidative of their home experience, for example, with their extended family. So they're spending less to go to school. So that means less debt. So that's a positive. We get, you know, um, uh, less cash flow for companies going through means probably less things like share buybacks, which is a, a wasteful thing. Um, it's interesting, you know, with the, um, the, Banks, as they came out, and the, the Canadian banks, as they come out this week and reported the hit to their earnings by having to so dramatically increase their loan loss provisions, um, they've of course pledged that they won't cut any dividend payouts. They're saying, "Don't worry, we're not going to cut the dividend," and the investors all cheer. But if you look at that, that means that they have to essentially pay out a hundred percent of their earnings to shareholders over the next few years, as as they're sort of dealing with this new you know, compression in various income flows that they've been generating and increasing their bad debts, you know, this is where they're in a in a challenging environment. If consumers are pulling back, they're not trying to spend as much, they're not trying to borrow as much, uh, you know, you don't have as many able borrowers to pick up the slack. So there's a, the capital markets are in turmoil, you know, there's not as much new issuance going on in this environment. All those things compress earnings. You've got low rates, a, a, a low yield curve, so there's not much spread business to be done. So all these are very compressing factors for Canadian banks at the same time that they're having to promise that they'll continue to pay out as much as they have to their shareholder class. Well, what happens, of course, is that they have less money then for investment and it's worse for their financial health. They have less coffers that they can maintain uh, for strength and stability. So all this really puts comes back to this idea of how do they lower their overhead costs, which means, of course, as, they, as I mentioned with Bank of Montreal, just one example, but where they say, hey, we don't need all these, you know, millions of square foot in these massive office towers if we can reallocate our our staff to work from their own home, we can lower costs dramatically and we can try and get some margin back. So, um, you know, so again, it's uh, negative ultimately. It may be okay for maintaining the dividend at current levels, but it doesn't speak to whether or not, you know, there'll be increases in the future, whether there'll be capital gains increases in the share price. Um, I thought it was very interesting that in the bounce back that's happened, and I've been writing about this, so, you know, we had the big drawdown, 37% from February to March 23rd, and then we've had a big bounce in a lot of things since, um, particularly driven by the largest five um, market cap tech-orientated companies, you know, the the Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, the same suspects, they've been leading this big resurgence, but the Canadian uh, real Real estate uh, trusts, for example, um, are still 30% from their peak in February. The Canadian banks are still about 24% from their peak. And we're very likely in the midst of a, of a bear market rally, so to speak, which means that we'll see probably another two or three or four legs down before this thing completes, which is the typical way in which things move. So as you get these next legs down, you know, I think that there's going to be more strain um, as prices fall for the investor class, but ultimately this is all bringing more uh, breathing room for the consumers, which is desperately needed, right? So less traveling, less driving, less less cheaper auto insurance, for example, uh, cheaper rent and accommodation outlays, cheaper consumer goods, the world's awash in things like um, cars, used cars, also um, uh, fashion, the inventory of uh, goods has never been as high as it is to the amount they're selling uh, right now. So there's this huge backlog of all these uh, 
things that need to be sold. So that's deflationary in terms of price. So I think there's a, there's a lot of positives. Of course, less CO2 emissions, less air pollution. You know, um, all these things are ultimately beneficial on the consumer and healthier lifestyle uh, side, but it's the asset owners and lenders that are in for the give back phase here. And I think that is where um, people have a potential vulnerability. I saw in the U.S. some bicycle shops are sold out because people have rediscovered cycling. Yeah, and walking. Um, you know, I think, I really do think that this whole keeping up with the Joneses mentality, the marketing machine was selling everyone in the pre-COVID phase has taken a big hit. And people realize that there's joy to be had in smaller things, in card games, in doing puzzles, in things that, you know, don't involve a lot of uh, running around like a chicken with your head cut off. And I think this is a healthy swing back. And um, it's good, but it's not GDP producing particularly, right? So, again, we have to uh, – we've got a massive amount of – government support right now coming in as emergency measures. I think that, you know, we're worried about the second wave of a virus uh, returning in the fall. Um, and in part and parcel with that, I'm worried about the second wave of financial strife when the emergency payments, you know, come to an end. And then the expectation is, well, do we do another wave of emergency payments? And, you know, as even Jamie Dimon said this week, you can't keep propping the stock market up indefinitely, not on the on, on the public purse where the debt is just astronomical because we know from all the economic studies show that the more you add the debt, the slower. You, it's like you just reach into the future and grab growth uh, from the future and spend it now and you're putting a weight that's making things slower and slower and more and more deflationary. So that is really not a long-term solution. It's meant to have been mer- emergency, but you know this emergency I think is going to continue in fits and starts for the next you know, potentially a year or more. Danielle, thank you so much for chatting with us. Hey, thank you. My guest has been Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite. If you have any questions for Danielle or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter at How Street. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.